Hi guys. Hi. Hello. How is everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Rachel Hollis podcast. I was thinking the other day, I was like, do you remember, maybe this still exists, but I honestly, I don't know who watches cable TV anymore besides like my Aunt Linda. Do you remember when shows like morning shows or afternoon shows, they had like a a theme song? Remember when Oprah had, I mean, Oprah would change her theme song every few years. Those of you who are old enough who were sort of Oprah babies like I was where you, you know, came home after school and you watched an episode of Oprah. Um, I was thinking about that yesterday that like these shows used to have theme songs and many of them are still stuck in my head even kind of obscure, random daytime talk shows. Like I still, to this day, I think the show was on for like two years. There was a morning show called The Mike and Molly Show. Do you guys remember? I, I for, There's no way. It's like, I gotta be the only person on the planet who remembers The Mike and Molly Show, but I remember their theme song, which was like, um, in some morning and grab a cup of coffee. It's time to watch The Mike and Molly Show the Mike and Molly show. I mean, wow. It's like, I can't remember important facts, but I can still remember theme songs from shows in like 1992 when I would stay home sick from school. Um, The point is, I was like, man, I need to write myself a theme song. So instead of having any kind of intro, it'll just be some fun dorky song that I wrote on a ukulele. And in case you're wondering, I don't know how to play a ukulele, but I would figure it out for this for something this important. Uh, So welcome to another episode of the show. I love today's topic because it is a question I got from y'all. Or more specifically, this is a question I got from Stephanie in Ohio. She called into the hotline to ask this one. And I always give people the option. It says on the recording, like, you can tell us if you want us to play the your voicemail, which I love. So if you guys don't mind, like, let me play the voicemail because I love, I think it's really powerful to hear your voices. But Stephanie said she didn't want her voice played. She just wanted this question answered. And it's a great question. So I want to dig into it today, which is how do you grow your intuition? Stephanie's like, I, she's like, I'm trying really hard to listen to my gut and like my inner knowing, but I feel like I'm constantly second guessing myself. And I'm debating or I start to kind of spiral out in my head because I think I'm making the wrong decision. She says, how do I know the difference between like what's my gut and what's my head? Which is a great question. It's a really good question, especially because if you ever listened to the interview I did with my friend Kimberly. So Kimberly is um, someone that I was working with who ended up becoming a friend of mine, but she's an energy healer. And hopefully you guys have listened to that episode. If not, go back and check it out. But Kim did this episode and then incredibly, because you guys are the best, so many listeners became clients of Kimberly's uh, because she can do her energy work from anywhere in the world. She can do it on Zoom. Women from all over the world started working with her, which is amazing and has been incredible and life-changing for her in all the best ways. But one of the things she told me, she's like, man, there is such a theme that I am seeing in the women who I'm I'm working with because of your show. And I was like, oh my gosh, do tell. Like, tell me, what are you seeing? And hold on, I'm just adjusting. And Kim says, they really are struggling with trusting themselves. They're really having a hard time trusting their gut, trusting their intuition, trusting the connection to self, all of it, they're really having a hard time. And I guess I wanna start there because Stephanie from Ohio, I want you to know that you're not alone. I think that we're told that women especially, that we are supposed to have this deep, like we were born with it, intuition that guides us. And that is 100% the truth. You are supposed to have that, but it's not your fault that you don't. Most of us, like most, most, most of us from the time we were little girls have been told that someone else knows best. 
We've been told to trust a voice of authority over our own inner knowing, right? We grow up and like daddy knows best or mama knows best or the church knows best or anybody who's older than me knows best or teachers or it's very rare that women especially are raised to understand their inner knowing and that they can trust that part of themselves. And, you know, I I love the reminder as for anybody who's on a spiritual journey and is trying to understand their spirituality in bigger ways, especially for those of you who grew up in the church or are very much inside the church, I think that there is this conflict, this unfair conflict that happens where people can get their feathers ruffled when we talk about this idea of trusting yourself because so many people inside of faith are taught that God knows best and they're supposed to listen to God. But I don't think that there's a difference between that gut feeling. I think that is God. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I believe that all these things are the same. I believe you know, be still and know that I am. To hear the still small voice inside you, that is something I've had since I was little. I, I Not to get too far down a rabbit hole with y'all, but that intuition that is the voice of our creator, that is, it's all one and the same. My inner knowing, I think, comes from something much greater than me, but it is me. Because God is in us. Oh, I'm sorry. I feel like some theologians are going to be like, you have, you don't, that's okay. You don't have to vibe with exactly what I'm saying. But I personally don't think that there's any disconnect between like listening to the voice of your creator that is also in you. I think that they are one and the same. And I think that the more aligned we are with ourselves, the more aligned we are with the universe and creation and God and everything greater than us. And I really would caution you to challenge anyone who tells you that you can't trust yourself. Oh, well, I have to trust God. Well, okay, the problem, the problem is not in trusting God. The problem is that for so many of us, God is is interpreted through the lens of a church, a pastor, which is usually, not saying always, but usually is the voice of a man who maybe has absolutely no idea what's going on in your life. So someone stands on you know, stage every Sunday and preaches to you, and that sort of becomes the filter for what God is. There's a great quote that I'm gonna paraphrase right now, which essentially says, that when you make God a man, you make man God. Meaning, if every image that you've been given throughout your life is the image of God as a man, which like, all respect, oh, so much respect. Um, God is non, there's no gender to God. If you believe that the creators of the heavens and the earth, the most powerful, the all-knowing, the I am, the alpha and the omega, that that is a gender, something is wrong. It's why when I'm talking about God, I will use the pronoun her, I will use she, because it doesn't make a difference, right? God is neither. So if, I, if it doesn't matter, then I'm gonna go ahead and say she and her, because why not? The reason that I'm starting here, because you're like, wait, we're trying to figure out how to trust our intuition. Why are you talking about God and gender? And all? Because there is a disconnect between women believing that they have a right to trust themselves because they have been taught to trust authority that was man. So if men know best, if daddy knows best, if they know best, of course, it's hard for you to trust your own thoughts, your own words, especially, yeah, some of us had amazing parents, incredible upbringings, were given guidance and wisdom and told that we had worth and value, but many of us didn't. 
Many of us were not told those things. We were told that little girls should be seen and not heard. We were taught that our value was in the way that we looked. We were taught that to be worthy, we should be thin, we should be pretty, we should be pleasing, we should find a man who wanted to marry us, we should be a mother. All of those things are so twisted because they get put on us from the time that we were little. If you choose to marry a man, if you choose to have children, if you cho that's incredible. But we can't make sweeping generalizations about every single woman or what it means to be a woman or how women show up. And from the time we're little, we're told and taught all of these things that get us further and further away from ever asking the question about what we think. What do we think is right? What do we think is best? And this doesn't just happen in religion or gender. This happens in the way that we're taught to approach our bodies and body image. I mean, raise your hand if you grew up and you had already tried some kind of diet by the time you were 13 years old. By 13 years old, I already knew about all kinds of diets. I had already tried diets. I had done different things because I saw my moms and my aunts and my big sisters doing those as well, right? Now, again, think of diet culture for a minute. Most women, at least here in the U.S., are raised from a very early age to worship at the idol of thinness. It's a religion in this country, this pursuit of being thin. Being thin means you're pretty. Being thin means you're, you are strong and smart and better than other people. Like, it's crazy. And within that vortex of chasing a certain body image, comes 10,000 different messages that are all conflicting with each other about what it will take to be this ideal person, right? Maybe you should do keto, maybe you should do Adkins, maybe you should do South Beach or Slim Fast or Weight Watchers or Sally Craig, Sally Craig? Jenny Craig. <laughs> um, there's so many different mixed messages. Carbs are bad, carbs are good, protein's good, don't have trans fat, well, some fat's good. Think of how many mixed messages you've been given in a single category. You have learned over and over and over that you can't be trusted. You can't be trusted with food. You can't be trusted with knowing what's best for your spirituality. You can't be trusted with your body. You can't be trusted. You can't be trusted. There's so many things confusing you, which by the way, just to go off on a little tangent about this for a minute, anything that is working that hard to confuse you, there's a reason. Because if you are confused, you will continue to spend money to try and solve the problem. Let me say it again for the people in the back. If you are confused about something, you will continue to spend money to try and figure out what the solution is to your problem. Because God forbid you should learn to trust yourself and your intuition when it comes to anything. Because trusting yourself and intuition is not going to make anybody else more money. If you don't trust yourself, if you feel confused, that's when you'll spend money to figure it out. That's why the diet industry is a, oh my, billions and billions and billions of dollars are spent every year by people who are confused and don't trust themselves. And so they look to experts, right? And there's nothing wrong with going out and finding information. The problem is that when that diet doesn't work, that book doesn't get you there, that exercise program falls off. I'm just using health as one example in your life. But when it doesn't work, you don't blame the diet. You blame yourself, which means that you have just another evidence or you have just another piece of evidence to tell you why you can't be trusted. So Steph, it's no, like, it's no wonder that when you make a decision that you believe is from your inner knowing, you second guess yourself and you confuse yourself so much that you stop doing anything altogether and you stay stuck. So this conversation today are some steps that I think that you can take to get in closer alignment with that inner voice, that inner knowing, and that you can learn to trust yourself, that you can learn to trust your gut and 
that because you know you can trust your gut, you'll understand when it's your truth and when it's just like your brain, your sort of lizard brain freaking out and telling you that you must be wrong. Okay, so that's the intention today. Woo, fired up. Some morning, I'm already fired up. <laughs> All right, okay, the first, I, I wrote yesterday, because I was prepping, oh gosh, I got this far away. I was prepping for this yesterday, and I wrote all sorts of ideas down, but this morning I thought of one that I feel like supersedes the other five. And I would like to start with this idea because it's a little bit off topic of intuition or trust. Just let me let me set this up. Um, I am very decisive. Me, your girlfriend, Rach, so decisive, meaning I make a decision and I go. And I've been like that as long as I can remember. And I've been like that because it took me a while to learn to trust my intuition, but I have always trusted that I would figure it out no matter what it is. I think that one of the biggest fatal flaws for people in the world that keeps them stuck, that keeps them from achieving their goals and dreams is that they believe there is a perfect right answer, a perfect right road, the exact way that they should head, and that if only they can figure out what that is, then their life will work out okay. And I do not believe that. So let's just start right there. I don't believe that there is a perfect answer. I don't believe that there's an exact road to head. I believe there's a direction and that when I start out in that direction, no matter what I choose, no matter what, even when it's the perfect way, even when it is aligned for my greater good, for my involvement as a human, for me to achieve the dream that I have in mind, even then I'm gonna come up against obstacles, roadblocks, things that are hard. Like that's gonna happen no matter what. People get stuck in analysis paralysis, where they are frozen because they're trying to analyze everything to see what the perfect solution is, thinking that if they choose the perfect solution, then it won't be hard. Sister, it is going to be hard no matter what you do. So stop staying here, just freaking do something. I have absolute faith that no matter what, I'll figure it out, right? Like. You move to a city, you're like, I've always wanted to move to a new city, so I'm gonna move to a new city, but, oh my God, what if this, what if that? What if I don't make any friends? What if I hate it? What if the kids hate it? What? Okay, then you move again. Like, the, guys, it, everything is not a zero sum game, right? Like, it doesn't mean that this is the right answer and this is the wrong one. Everything, can work out, will work out. So long as you believe that's true, everything's working for you. So if that's the case, even if you sort of take a detour that didn't work, okay, cool. This, we get really confused, I think, about how much time we have, right? We think, I gotta hurry up, I gotta hustle, I gotta do this now. And I, I 100% had this. Pre-COVID, I didn't even realize that this was something I believed, and I did. I believed that I needed to push harder. I believed I needed to go faster. I believed that I would only have one shot at any of these things. I believed all sorts of stuff. And it's just not true. By the grace of God, I will have, you know, I hope I have 60 more years on this planet. Right? And that's what I'm going to bet on. I'm not going to bet on the fact that I've got two weeks. I'm going to bet on the fact that I have 60 years. And if that's not the case, okay. But I guarantee those 60 years will be a lot less stress because I think I've got a long runway. I think I'm in this for the long game. I think that that means I can go slower. That means I can be graceful. That means I can be present with my children 
in this moment, instead of believing that I got to hustle and roll and travel and do all these things and miss their childhood so that like, oh, well, someday I'll have enough money and then we can really go on vacation or then we can really celebrate or then. And it's just, I just don't believe it's true. I believe that life is long. By the grace of God, we don't know, but by the grace of God, life will be long. And if my life is long, that means I've got time. And frankly, if I'm wrong about this, if, if you know, unbeknownst to me, I've got two weeks left, believing that I'm going to have a long, good life is going to make whatever life is left so much better. And if I believe that I've got a long life, that means I don't have to carry stress or worry or fear about not moving fast enough. I can let go of any shoulds. I can stop shoulding all over myself. Well, I should do this and I should do that and I should have had this done by now, right? You have to trust that no matter what happens, you will figure it out because your fear of getting it wrong is keeping you from doing anything. Like the idea that, Steph, that you would make a decision, believe it was, gui- believe you were guided and that was your intuition and then talk yourself out of it. Sp- oh no, girl. Once I make a decision, boom, done, we're going. I don't debate it or question it another second. You know what it reminds me of? Years ago, it's just popped in my head. Years ago, I went to get a facial and I was... I was planning my wedding. I was close to my wedding. This was years ago. I was getting married. I was like 20 years old or something. And I, oh man. Okay, so I'm sitting in in this lobby waiting to get a facial and one of the magazines on the coffee table was a wedding magazine. And I'm like, oh, cool. You know, my wedding's like a month away or something. So I'm excited. I'm gonna, and I'm flipping through. And as I'm flipping through this magazine, I'm getting more and more depressed because all I'm seeing in the magazine are the most gorgeous weddings and the coolest ideas. And I'm like, oh, I wish I would have done that. Oh, dang it, those flowers. I like those colors better than my colors. And I wish that I had. And I'm like spinning out over all the things I wished I would have done. And I learned a really important life lesson, which was like, no, you you are looking outside yourself. You're questioning decisions that you've made. It's only going to make you unhappy. It's only going to make you anxious or unsure. And the color of the flowers didn't matter anyway, right? Not Just as a side note, none of the stuff that I was hoping for that was going to be like the thing that made our wedding great, none of that even mattered. The stuff that made our wedding great was the stuff that I never even thought about, like our friends dancing all night and, you know, like, it just all these great things that had nothing to do with the tiny details I was obsessing over. So once I make a decision, I go and my trust starts with knowing that whatever happens, I'm gonna figure it out and also believing that everything is happening for me. I believe that. I believe that everything's happening for me. I um, I had a really interesting sort of grapple with this. I'm sure if you've hung out with me, you've heard me talk about this a lot, this idea that I believe that life is happening for us and not to us. And because I have that belief, I tend to spend a lot of time analyzing hard things that I've gone through. And because I'm looking for the lesson and it's something that has served me really well and I believe I'm the woman I am because of a willingness to like dig into the hard stuff and figure out why it happened or how I contributed to it. And one recently, I can talk about this better now, but um, I did an episode in, I think January, which you could go back and listen to about losing, I I keep trying to not say that. Um, I don't like the term losing my baby because I didn't lose her. She wasn't I didn't like leave her somewhere, but I was pregnant and my baby died. And, um, you know, that happened in December and it's the end of March. And I still 
have really been having a hard time. Not a hard time in that it's not affecting all day, every day, but I'm still really grieving that loss and mourning it very deeply and really trying to, I've just spent months and months trying to understand why. Why did this happen? Why, why, why? Because I wasn't planning on it and because I got pregnant while using birth control for the second time in my life, um, I thought that maybe that meant that like God wanted that baby to be here or that the universe had a plan that I didn't understand. I, I don't want more children and didn't want more children. I have four kids and I'm great and it's also a lot. Um, so I, I didn't have any plans to have more kids. And then when that happened, I was like, oh my, well, maybe I don't understand. And, um, so it happened and it was hard to grapple with, but then I really quickly got so excited because I thought, oh, well, okay. You know, the universe always knows better than I do. So I'm going to trust this. And then I got really excited. And, um, so when I, I have told this story before, but I went in, um, to the doctor for routine ultrasound and um, the baby didn't have a heartbeat anymore. I couldn't, I just couldn't understand it. And I'm proud of myself because I feel like I've done a lot of work to even be able to talk to you guys about this without crying. But I was crying the other day. I was crying about it and I was crying to my boyfriend and he was like, baby, why do you, why do you feel like you keep needing to like, like dig this up and unpack it from every angle? And I was like, because I just want to know why. I want to know why. I want to know why. Why did this happen? I don't understand why. And I feel like if I could just, if I could just unpack it enough, then I would understand. And he was like, oh, sometimes shitty things just happen. Sometimes it's just that. And there isn't, there isn't going to be a great why. And it's the first time that I've really taken that to heart. That I understand that sometimes shitty stuff just happens. And that how something can be for you is how you're shaped by the process and who you become through the process, but it doesn't always have to be a lesson that you're learning. And so I have trust in myself and I have trust in God that I am being shaped and formed into the person that I'm supposed to be and that I will figure it out no matter what happens and the trust starts there. You're not going to be able to trust yourself in a decision that you have to make or trust yourself to like listen to your inner knowing if you can't start with that truth that no matter what happens you will be okay that no matter what happens you are on the path and that no matter what happens you will figure it out so that's what I thought of this morning now Here's some more tactical advice, some things that are a bit less nebulous and a bit more like do this thing to make your intuition stronger. The first thing is, I, the first thing I wrote down is inner knowing. So how I thought to describe this was the difference between feeling something and thinking something. Feeling something and thinking something. So your inner knowing, I believe, is always, always, always always trying to talk to you. But there's a solid chance if you feel like you're out of touch with your intuition that you have ignored her so many times, that you've shoved her down, that you've blocked her out, that you've numbed her with food or alcohol or pills or drugs or sex or sleep or whatever, that she's, it's like a little kid that's been told to shut up so many times that they just stop trying to talk. So part of this is that you need to get quiet and feel. So meditation is really great for this. Prayer is really great for this. Understanding kind of how your body 
I'm going to use meditates best. I'm using air quotes if you're not watching this on YouTube. Um, I say meditates because there are different types of meditation for me. So I, if I am trying to really get in touch with my, what I'm thinking and feeling on the inside and what I believe I'm being guided to do, I believe in spirit guides and angels and hearing the voice of my creator. And if I want to do that, I have to get quiet. So how I personally do that is I will put on meditation music. Um, You can grab that on Spotify. You can tell your Alexa app. Like I literally tell her every morning, Alexa, play meditation music. She just will have a playlist ready to go for you. And I'll just sit and get quiet and focus on my breathing. I don't think that I'm a very good, um, I'm not like a meditator I don't know, like, you know, those teachers, like you could, Jay Shetty will teach you how to meditate and he'll do it in a very, in the proper way. I can't quiet my mind for 20 minutes at a time or some like two hours, I can't. Um, So I just focus on my breathing and when I'm, I close my eyes, I focus on my breathing and I try, I take this for what it's worth, but I try and um, my third eye chakra, so if you know much much about chakras in the yogic tradition, um, right between your eyebrows a little bit above would be your third eye. So I close my eyes and I just try and focus on that spot. One, I guess it would be great because energetically you're opening up your third eye, but there's something about for me if I'm, if I'm, <laughs> I don't know if this sounds weird, but if my eyes are closed and I'm trying to still focus on something, I'm less likely to get distracted. But if I get distracted, if my mind starts to wander and I'm like, oh, I need to get bread for the kids' sandwiches for lunch, as soon as I notice it, I just come back to trying to focus on that spot again. I don't get angry at myself. I don't get mad. I'm really gentle with, you know, my mind tends to wander and that's okay, but I'm just trying to sit and be still. It's one of my favorite scriptures is be still and know that I am. And I feel like in that moment, You can't listen to the voice of I am unless you are practicing it, which is something I really want you guys to hear. Like start with two minutes. Do two minutes of breathing, eyes closed, focused, quietness for two weeks and then do three minutes and then do four and you build up like anything else. This is a practice. It's not something that will immediately come to you. You've spent you know, 46 years ignoring this thing. It's going to take more than three sessions to try and feel comfortable getting it back. So meditation is really helpful and really pay attention to, is this a thought I'm having or a feeling that I'm having? Um, a great way to look at this is my favorite question to ask friends or sometimes podcast guests when they're talking about something that went really horribly wrong. A relationship where the person turned out to be someone totally different than they thought or a business partner who went rogue or a situation that went really badly. My favorite question to ask is what's the first red flag that you ignored? Because I found in my own life and when I challenge people with this question that everybody has a moment where they knew They had that inner knowing. They had a feeling in their gut that was like, this is wrong. So a powerful question is like, can you find a time in your life where you knew and you ignored it? That's number one. Because what I would actually say is you probably can find a hundred situations in your life where you knew you had a feeling, but you ignored it. And two, If you can even do a little bit of more deep diving and ask yourself, why did you ignore it? I think I've told you all this story before, but I have a a very dear friend who had a project, huge project, very successful project, um, public, a celebrity thing. And publicly, it was like, oh my gosh, she's living the best life. And privately, it was hell. Privately, the business partner who was helping her to bring this thing to fruition was so wrong. And again, publicly, it's like the fame, the fortune, all of it's happening privately. It was miserable. And she was telling me the story and I was like, oh, 
when did you have the first red flag about this business partner? Because there is no way that you got through this whole process and suddenly everything changed. And she was like, honestly, I knew at the first meeting. I knew at the first meeting. I'm like, okay, why did you ignore it? And she said, because the opportunity was so big and I was so excited and I told myself or I believed the idea that if I didn't do it with this person that I would never have the opportunity. So her ego and her fear and her scarcity mindset made her do something that later ended up being a bit of a nightmare. And you could say like, yeah, she got money and yeah, she got, you know, celebrity, but I, she's my friend, so I know the hell that she lived through for three years. And it wasn't at all what it could have been. And it wasn't, the final product wasn't what she would have hoped. And all of these things went wrong, like really bad, like legally, just absolute crap behind the scenes. Public didn't ever know. But had she trusted her intuition about this business partner, I believe she would have been better set up. I believe the universe had something better in store, but she ignored it. So if you can go back and look and say, okay, when was I feeling something and my brain talked me out of it, my rational brain talked me out of it and I ignored what I was feeling. I have this happen all the time and I annoy the crap out of my team. Like I have big fancy agents and you know, for all the things, because that's what happens. I have you know agents who work on the podcast and agents who work on my books and agents who work on movie stuff and you know, someday when I finish the edit on this screenplay, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But I will not work with people that I have, there's just a bad vibe. And it's crazy because sometimes it's really important partners. And I've done this in the past where I was so excited about people in my industry and getting to collab with them and getting to do things. And then when I got to know them, I realized like, mm -mm, this is a bad, something's wrong. And I can't tell you what it is, but I just know in my heart that I don't wanna be around this energy. And I don't. And I've walked away from so much money and so many opportunities because I just, my, my intuition tells me that this is not the right thing to do. And I just, I, I won't. I would literally rather go work at a coffee shop with good, awesome humans than make a movie with a bunch of douchebags. I really would. Because I believe that the opportunity to make a movie with awesome humans will show up eventually. But I think that that intuition is my inner knowing saying this is not the right path for you. And that's a that's a personal value for me, right? Like it doesn't have to be the same for you. But my, one of my mottos is I want to make cool shit with cool people. That became my motto after years of making cool shit with people who weren't great and absolutely having the thing I was making be destroyed by like either because I was inside of a situation where it became so bad I didn't even wanna work on the project anymore or because maybe the project was cool but behind the scenes it was just like a crap show. Yeah, I don't know. I'm. I really listen to my gut. And I think that if you're not used to doing that, that if you go back historically and just sort of take some time and think about what were people in your life that turned out to be not at all who you thought they were? Or what were experiences that turned out not at all, like they turned out so badly? Like think of those times and think, did I ever sense it beforehand? You know, there's a an old book by Gavin De Becker called The Gift of Fear. Um, I remember watching him on Oprah years ago. And he says in that book that humans are the only animal that will sense fear or will sense that something's off and walk toward it anyway. And women do this all the time because they don't want to be impolite. They don't want to be seen as rude. They don't want to be too loud. They don't want people to think that they're bitches. They do all of these things. They like, 
you know, your mother-in-law thinks that you're supposed to do something, you do it because you don't want anyone to think that like you're not a team player, or you're not dedicated, or you're not whatever. You make all of these choices in opposition of what your inner knowing is telling you is true. Sometimes your inner knowing is like, no, bitch, you need to go take a nap. You don't need to do one more thing. You don't need to go to that workout class. You don't need to volunteer at the church bake sale. You don't need to be room mom. You don't need that. You need rest. And you ignore that voice inside you, that voice that comes from something greater than yourself. You ignore it because you think, nope, I got, I, you know what? It matters more what other people think of me than what I know to be true. And I don't want them to say that I'm lazy. And I don't want them to say that I'm not trying hard enough. And I don't want them to see that. So I'm going to go in opposition of what I know in my soul is the right thing for me. The other flip side is really powerful. It's one of my favorite things to meditate on is to think of something that has happened that just absolutely turned out so much better than you thought. Like it just ended up being this miracle, this amazing thing. And when you look back, you can see that it was divine providence. You can see that you were guided because I don't think it's possible to be led into something divine, into something that the universe has for you if you aren't on some level in touch with an inner knowing, even if it's just the smallest, tiniest bit. So if you can do some meditations on, okay, when did it go really right? When were times where I listened to my gut, even if it was a bit unconventional and it worked out really well, right? I think about this with my boyfriend, like the the love, like I'm being such a geek. And if you're listening to this instead of watching on YouTube, you don't see me like blushing and being a geek, but like I opened, um, he's out of town for work for like a week. And I opened a book, my book that I'm currently reading, I opened it and there was a note tucked inside this morning. And it was um, the most beautiful, amazing, poetic, sweet note. And the thing was, when I got in bed last night, there was the most amazing note tucked under my pillow. And what I know, because he does this whenever he goes out of town, is that I'm gonna continue to find those notes hidden all around the house. And this was a friend, I'm using air quotes, this was a friend I met for coffee a little over a year ago. This random thing, I had three different people tell me about this app, three different people. Whenever I hear something three times, I always think that the universe is guiding me. So I had three separate people tell me about this app that was for people who had higher profile jobs. So it wouldn't maybe be that easy to like meet new friends or meet like, you you know, just going on Instagram and be like, hi, you want to go meet me for coffee? But that you could find people sort of in your industry or um, who'd be cool. I don't know. So I got on this app because three different people told me about it. And then I was trying it out. And it was just silly. And I thought it was kind of fun but I hadn't met anybody. And then it all, I look back now and I'm like, every single step was guided. This, you know, this guy that I connected with and um, he has, he had and has a very cool job. So I was like, well, that's a cool job. And that'd be cool to like connect with someone in the music industry. Like, what's that all about? And um, we like connected on the app. And I remember it was during this like crazy snowstorm that um, Austin had and, um, he was like, oh, my, um, like, he needed to, I forget why, but he couldn't be on the app anymore. So he's like, just text me. It's easier to text me. And I had all kinds of creeper guys be like, let me get your number. Let me, and all of them are like, no, you can't. My number, get away from me. And this random guy that I had just connected with, he was like, here's my number. Like, just text me. And for some reason, I was like, yeah, I, I can text him. And I text him and then we were just literally friends. Like we were trading like, oh, here's the book I'm reading and whatever. And then we finally met for coffee. And then we just were like friends who had coffee and um, it just grew. And every part of that was guided. Every part. I can't like totally even believe. I have a, a sweet friend who 
again, because I don't believe in accidents, I was on a business trip and one of my friends that I haven't seen, you know, we text each other all the time, but we live in different places and neither of us live in the city that we were in for work. And she walked into where I was and I jumped up. I gave her a big hug. I was so excited to see her. And she just like word vomited. She was like, I'm getting a divorce and nobody knows. And I was like, oh, like come in, come in here for the real thing. And I ended up, you know, having the beautiful opportunity to hold space for her in that. And I don't believe that that was an accident at all. I believe that that was guided. Both of us were guided to be there today or both of us were guided to be there that day so that we could have that conversation. And yeah, I just, I really listen. Guys, I'm always listening. And there's a bit of whimsy in listening to those, the voices and believing that it's guiding you to something better. I wrote a note here too about listening to your body. Your body will warn you before your mind will ever catch up and sometimes your mind actually won't catch up so pay attention to what is your body language when you meet someone right like sometimes you know based on however you feel when you're meeting new people or you're around new experiences sometimes you'll be closed off right like your body language is your arms are folded your sort of shoulders are hunched you're feeling a need to to be protective because maybe that's just your energy you get a little nervous around new people but sometimes our bodies naturally do that when let me take that again editor but also our bodies will naturally respond to a situation that we don't trust. We don't trust that person, we don't trust that experience, or even your body is telling you that there's this idea, this decision, this dream, this path that you're trying to chase, that there's something about it that's not right. Um, there's a really interesting stuff that you can research. Um, some people, this is gonna sound real woo woo. This is your woo. I should have like a, a like a sound that plays like here's your woo woo moment. Um, but there's lots of people that work with a pendulum, um, which is this idea that your body always knows the truth. You can research um, kinesiology, which is muscle testing in the body, and there's a ton of research on muscle testing and sort of your body knowing what's right and what's wrong. I can't, it's hard to show you right now, but just Google it if this is interesting to you at all. But I even teach my kids to do this. So um, uh, if you study kinesiology, there's different, um, oh gosh, I, I'm going to, I'm not gonna go down this rabbit hole. It's too long, it will take too long to explain, but I bet you could go on YouTube and look up videos. But essentially, muscle testing is, um, when we're trying to make a decision, is that your body knows the answer and that essentially like your muscles get weaker when there's a reaction, like your body's having a reaction to something. So you can't see me doing this right now, but I'm essentially holding, oh, if you're on YouTube, you can see it. But uh, if you're listening in podcasts, I apologize if this doesn't make a ton of sense. But imagining, uh, imagine I'm holding my index finger and my thumb together in a circle and I'm taking my other index finger and sort of like pushing it against, my, my fingers are, um, closed but not really hard um and if you listen to my episode with kimberly this is how she does her energy work is she's going through your body and she's doing this and when something is a yes for her her fingers stay closed and when something's a no the muscle gives way if you've ever worked with a uh, kinesiology you'll sometimes a doctor will they'll go through and sort of test all of your organs by you'll have one hand that's raised and then they're touching like your spleen your stomach your whatever and when an area is weak you, it's so crazy like your arm loses all of its muscle power i feel like what i'm saying makes no sense please go google it i swear if you can watch it you'll understand but um there's lots of people in a spiritual practice who will use a pendulum. Literally, they'll dangle something from their fingers and they ask their body, what is a yes? Or they ask the pendulum, what is a yes? It's your body because, <laughs> oh, bless.
classic, guys. This is the part where Rachel goes off because this is very hard to explain. I could do a whole episode about it. In fact, call the hotline if you have questions. The hotline is 737-400-4626. You can call and be like, bitch, we don't know what you're talking about. Please explain that more. Um, but you could do this with a pendulum, essentially dangling a chain from your fingers and uh, the pendulum will move in a certain direction if the answer is yes and a different direction if the answer is no. Another way that I learned this, um, uh, this was more of a kinesiology thing, was to stand upright, like stand with your feet on the ground, close your eyes, hands at your side, and ask your body, ask your inner knowing, just in your head, what is a yes? And you do this a few times, and when I do it, my yes is that my body sways forward a bit, and... I will ask my body what's a no and my body sways backwards. So you would do the same thing with a pendulum. You'd say what's a yes, what's a no. And you're not moving your hand, but the pendulum will start to swing. And it's because you're affecting, energetically you're affecting what your inner knowing knows the answer is. And you can test it, right? You can be like, am I wearing a black shirt? And you'll, it, it's wild what I'm saying. What I, the reason that I'm going off on this tangent is because if you feel like you are out of touch with your body, which many, many people are, many of us are disconnected from our bodies after a lifetime of feeling shame and having body image issues and being told that we're wrong and other and different. And so you've lost that connection. A pendulum or a muscle testing, kinesiology, or um, you know, sort of the swaying back and forth can be a really powerful way to get in touch with what your body is feeling. That was a very long-winded explanation, but it's a really powerful tool when it comes to intuition. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to advise on this one was to practice reading energy. To practice reading in energy because this again goes to the idea that your inner knowing I think always knows if a situation, a decision, a person is right for you or not. And I would suggest, you know, closing your eyes and thinking, like clear your mind um, and then think of friends, right? Like think of your best friend and what's the first word that pops up. Think of your partner. What's the first word that pops up? Think of a child. What's the first word that pops up? Your boss. Just keep doing this because that clear mind first word that comes up, if you're in touch with your intuition, is also a, is a very clear indicator. It's like reading someone's aura. So I don't know a ton. I, I actually wish I knew more about auras, but... I could tell you that I would meet someone and I'm like, if I sort of close my eyes and try and focus in on their energy or even like my best friends, I'll kind of get a feeling like, oh man, their energy is like really murky today. There's like, it's like a murky brownish green, like something. And I don't know what that means, but I know that that's very different than their normal, like bright, sunny, yellow, happy light. And I guess with this, it's just the idea of of trusting yourself because I don't know if anything that I've told you will track with someone who's deeply intuitive and like has been practicing this for 50 years and is a psychic or a medium and they have like a whole set of tools and they've gone to classes. I'm, I don't know if anything I've said will track with what other people believe about intuition. I am telling you what I know works for me. So maybe when I just said that my friend always has bright, sunny, yellow energy. And then when she was going through a hard season, she had like dark green, murky brown. Maybe there's someone who's like, oh, dude, yeah, auras mean this and the yellow means this and the green means this and that's why you're reading those things. Or maybe people are like, bitch, you don't know what you're talking about. But guess what? I'm not worried about it because this is how I interpret it to me. And I think that that's what matters most here is I can tell you how I get in touch with my intuition and the internet can tell you all sorts of ideas about how to get in touch with intuition. But what's going to matter most is that you develop a practice where you feel connected. That's what's going to matter most. And that you trust if 
you're like, oh, you know what? When I think of people, I don't get words or colors. I get sounds. I get music. That you trust that that's just the way that your internal self works. Yeah, it's about intuition. But Stephanie from Ohio, it's about learning to trust it more than ever. There's so many things bombarding us and making us believe that we can't be trusted, right? Like we're learning to trust ourselves less and less. And this, this idea of connecting again with your inner self, it's like an act of defiance. It's an act of rebellion to say, yeah, I'm gonna take in, that's incredible wisdom from this person. And man, the pastor had really good advice on this topic and that teacher told me this, that was so good. But I have to take all of those things inside of me and understand what's going to work best for me. And that is a practice that will last your whole life. So I hope that that was really helpful, guys. I hope you got something out of our conversation today. If you dug it, wherever you're getting this, if it's on podcast or YouTube, please subscribe. Really appreciate you subscribing to the show. And if you found this helpful, will you share it? If you made it this long, you made it past an hour That means something in it I think might have been good, fingers crossed. Share it with a friend, share it on your social, tell people what's up. I always think that one of the greatest ways that we can be leaders to our community is by when when something is really helpful to us, we share it with others. If you have a question like Stephanie in Ohio, make sure that you call into the hotline, the number, one more time, it's written on my wall, 737-400-4626. You can call and ask me a question and I will turn it into an episode of the show. And you have the right to say, you know, you don't want your your voice to be used, but I really love it when you guys let that happen because I think it's so much cooler. But until I see you next time, I am Rachel Hollis. I'm glad to be here on this journey with you. And if nobody's told you this lately, I want you to hear it from me. I love you and I'm rooting for you. Mm-hmm.